Hoppity Christ, I freaking love Star Wars. And who doesn't? It's one of the most, if not one of the most, highest grossing media franchises that define a generation. For many years since 1977, Star Wars was everywhere. Movies, animated TV shows, video games, novels and comics in the expanded universe, novels and comics in the canon universe, the list goes on and on. As much as I love other successful franchises, Star Wars is the one I will hold dear to the day I become one with the Force. So to celebrate the 40th anniversary of this fictional phenomenon, I'm going to be looking back and give thoughts on all the Star Wars movies, TV series, in the order that they were released, as well as do few occasional countdowns. And all in the month of May, and before the upcoming Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi, comes out this Christmas. So let's stop chit-chatting and get right on with the show with the one that started it all, Star Wars. Okay, I know it's called Star Wars Episode 4 A New Hope, but I'm calling Star Wars for the sake of it. Just head up guys, I'm gonna go into full spoiler territory, which means I'm gonna go into full detail about these movies and the TV series. So if you have not seen the movies themselves or the TV series in the Star Wars universe, I suggest you stop the video right here. As you can see, you will see the spoiler warning in every video I do about Star Wars. But if you don't really care about spoilers and you just want to know my thoughts about the movies and the TV series, then that's absolutely fine, but fair warning still. So Star Wars is an epic space opera film that takes place in a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away where this galactic civil war is happening against the Rebel Alliance and the evil Galactic Empire. And after the famous opening crow is done, you see the rebel ship just flying past over you, which is being pursued by this huge star destroyer just being shooting lasers right onto the ship. That is just one opening scene I will never get tired of. It's just really top notch. That's how you really begin to film that popular. So the Rebel Alliance is being pursued by the Empire because the spies of that Rebel Alliance sto have stolen these plans from this ultimate weapon called the Death Star. This space station that is the size of a moon capable with enough power to destroy one single planet. If that doesn't show you that this Empire means business, then trust me, we'll we will get more into depth into that as the series goes on. In the end, these rebels get defeated by the Imperial forces under the command of one of my favorite movie characters, Darth Vader. And their rebel leader, Princess Leia, gets captured. But before she does, she slips the Death Star plans, including a message, into R2-D2, this cute, lovable, brave droid. And he goes along with this golden protocol droid reason, C-3PO. They both escape in this escape pod and fly down straight onto desert planet Tatooine before they become spare parts. Unfortunately for a dynamic duo, they get they get from one shitty situation into another. They got captured by these small hooded aliens called Jawas. Best funniest part of the movie was when R2D was all on this canyon when C his companion C3 people decided not to go that way. He's all like, no more adventures. I'm not going that way. And then this Jawa just came right out of nowhere and just shoots and electrocutes R2D2 like <laughs> The way that small hooded alien just tried to do a jump get so priceless. I can't help myself to slapping my ass off on that. So see free people and R2 to get captured and then they got sold off to these mo moisture farmers, le moisture farmers, Owen and Baru Lars and their nephew, Luke Skywalker. And for right there, Luke Skywalker is pretty much like the be the bell of Star Wars. Like he just wants more than this provi than this provincial life. You just want to be out there helping with the Rebel Alliance and all that, but most of his friends are gone and his uncle just wants them to stay and just help him for a whole nother year and he's just, no, I want something more. And a sudden twist of fate happened. Luke, when Luke was cleaning up the droids, he sees this message from Arthur D2 of Princess Leia saying, help me over one Kenobi, you might only hope over and over again. Then Arthur D2 mentions to see 3 po that he is the property of this Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Luke Skywalker goes like, I wonder if he means Ben Kenobi, this old hermit that lives at the end of this Dune Sea. And funny enough, when they meet up with this Ben Kenobi, this, he's not a strange old hermit, he is, act, he is legitimately an actual Jedi. Obi-Wan take, takes Luke Skywalker and, 
and c 3 po and R2-D2 back to his hut, you know, where he lives on Tatooine, and goes on to explain how he once was a Jedi Knight like Luke's father was, and how that these Jedi Knights were like the guardian's piece of ju justice before the dark times, before the Empire screws everything up. Not only do I like this scene which shows um, the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi fully, but it also goes into full depth on the mythos about the Force, you know, like, the Force is what the Jedi gives his, pow gives his power. It's this mysterious energy field created by all living things. It penetrates us, surrounds us, it, it binds all the galaxy, the galaxy itself together. When Obi-Wan sees this message by Leia telling him that she's failed to deliver him straight to Old One to visit her father, Senator Bail Organa, to help, you know, him fight against the Empire, he encourages Luke in joining him by saying, you must learn the ways of the Force if you want to become a Jedi like your father. But unfortunately, Luke is conflicted at this morning. He's like, I can't go and help and rebel alliance. I can't. I, I've got work to do. And so, because of my uncle said so. Speaking of Princess Leia, she's having quite a rough time being a prisoner of the Empire. You know, the Darth Vader is torturing, torturing her with this probe droid with this needles, just going. You like feel the tension right there. But then this high-ranking officer, Gov Grand Moff Tarkin, has a better idea of persuasion. He, he takes the de he, he takes the Death Star to her homeworld, Alderaan. If it. And, and tells her, if you don't tell us where the rebel base is, we are going to straight up kill everyone on that planet. So they had no choice but to give away the location of the rebel base, which is Dantooine. But as we know from bad guys, they never keep their promises. Governor Tarkin just gives the order, you may fire where I'm ready. And Leia was just like, what? That's like the same reaction of what the audience is like thinking. Governor Tarkin just gives the order, the... You see the super laser coming out of the Death Star and it just straight up blow up Alderaan, just like, just like that. If you want to know like who's the real main villain of this movie, it's not really Darth Vader, even though he is an imposing threat not to cross paths with. It's Governor Tarkin, he, he's the one. He's the big boss in this movie. You can really tell when Darth Vader was choking out this officer when he was like insulting him for his sorcerer's ways. He's going, and he's four stroking the life and feeling like, I find your luck. Very disturbing. Then Governor Tarkin is all like, enough of this, Vader, release him. Alright, I have my fun. I still really do like Darth Vader choking out someone, it doesn't take him very, it doesn't take his knowledge about the Force very seriously. Meanwhile, back on Tatooine, Luke goes ahead with Obi-Wan Kenobi because his aunt and uncle are dead, like literally dead. He sees the rotting skeleton corpses at his hut and that's just dark as hell. Maybe not as shocking as blowing one planet up by a super weapon, but shocking nonetheless. So Luke and Obi-Wan go to Mos Eisley Spaceport when it went to this cantina for these strange a these strange aliens with amazing practical effects and, and great makeup, including this one guy that has two horns on his head that looks red on his face. And I was thinking, are you really, the, are you actually the devil in the Star Wars universe? And then they meet up with like one of my next favorite characters in the Star Wars universe, Han Solo, this cool looking smuggler, and also Chewbacca the Wookiee. They want to get on this planet and they go on one of these memorable starships called the Millennium Falcon, really great design. It's like one of my favorite starships next to the Millennium. Melino, uh, I think it's called Melino in Guardians of the Galaxy. But before they can do, unfortunately, for Han Solo, he has a debt to pay to, uh, jab to a gangster called Jabba the Hutt. And this bouncer Greedo just comes right up to him and just holds him at gunpoint. Just holds him at gunpoint like Han Solo's got nowhere to go. But he stays calm and cool about it, you know, not just showing a shred of fear. He's having an argument with Greedo that he's got the money, but he hasn't got it yet. And Greedo just continues taunting him. And the Han Solo's like, if you want to get the Millennium Falcon, you have to go over my dead body. And Greedo responds, that's the idea. He's been waiting a long time to do this. And Han Solo goes like, yes, I bet you have. Boom. And then he, he just shot, he really just shot some first onto Greedo. And Greedo just, pfft, dead, just on the table. One thing that quite ticks me off is that the special edition, the special, 2004 special edition changed that Han Solo didn't shot first, Greedo did. George Lucas just somehow digitally make Han Solo slightly move his head to the right and he shot Greedo and, and I don't know why that had to happen. It's just dumb. From what we learned from the 1997 theatrical release Star Wars, that badass space cowboys always, always shoot first. So Han, Chewie, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Luke Skywalker and the droids finally made it to Old One, find these palace asteroids just flowing out of nowhere when they went into hyperspace 
and they, and they found out that's com that is completely destroyed by the Empire. They then follow this TIE Fighter, which leads this small wound, which turns out to be the Death Star itself, and they get pulled in by the tractor beam, which they have no choice but to get captured as well. And what follows up is like two great missions happening at the same time. All one goes, all one goes to, s to turn off the tractor beam, where Han and Lou go and save Princess Leia from from the detention center. And what Columna is is one of the finest showdowns that this film has ever gave us. Darth Vader versus Obi Wan Kenobi. You see, Darth Vader is just right there waiting for waiting for Obi Wan Kenobi with his red lightsaber with his lightsaber on, and Obi Wan Kenobi does the same because he knows he's in for a fight. Darth Vader is coming on like, "I've been waiting for you, Obi Wan. We meet again at last." The circle is now complete. When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master. And all one spot is only a master of evil, Darth. For not more, when Luke and Han have rescued the princess, they're gonna go into the Millennium Falcon and get out of there, but Luke is just watching his fo his mentor going against this Dark Lord of the Sith. In the midst of the fight, Obi Wan just looks to Luke Skywalker, knowing his presence, and he looks back to his former apprentice, turned evil, and he just smiles at him, you know, just knowing that he's knowing he's gonna get his come up and soon. Then he just closes his eyes, holds up his lightsaber, Darth Vader just strikes him down and he just disappears into thin air. And I was like, whoa, where the hell did he go? Is he, is he actually dead? I mean, I, I think he's dead. Oh my God. You just killed Luke's mentor, you dick. And then Luke screams in agony, agony and the stormtroopers just, sh just fire back who were just watching the fight the whole time. And then Luke shoots them back in a fit of rage and he blasts the door in, in hope of like Darth Vader doesn't like come to get them either. And when Luke keeps on shooting, he hears his Nona's no voice telling him to run, Luke, run! And he does so. Luke goes straight into Millennium Falcon. They all get out of there safe and sound and they all go to Rebel Base to give back these plans. And now they're re and now we're ready for the finale. The Rebels find out from the plans that in order to destroy the Death Star that they have to go in this chasm and shoot these proton torpedoes into this small hole that somehow the Empire doesn't recognize that exists on the Death Star. It's a huge plot for the movie itself, which is joked around many a times, but it's actually fixed later in the series, which we'll get to right, which we'll get to later on. And they go to these cool starfighters called X-Wings and Y-Wings, cool looking designs. And the Rebels try their best, but unfortunately all the TIE Fighters, including led by Darth Vader, all of his last one, Luke Skywalker, has been guided by the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi, telling him to Use the force, Luke. And Darth Vader is like in the castle just chasing him, and he's just bewildered by this pilot. He's like, the force is strong, this one. When Vader finally has his shoot to kill, suddenly one of the TIE fighters just blow up from out of nowhere. Turns out to be Million Falcon. Han Solo just returns in nick of time to help Luke get these four to shoot these forms of torpedoes into the Death Star itself. And he does so with the help of the Force. And the Death Star blows up and Han Solo's like, gradually looks like, GREAT SHOT KID, THAT WAS ONE IN A MILLION! Han Solo and the other surviving pilots made back to the rebel base on Yavin 4 and they have a medal ceremony and that's where the movie ends. Overall, I enjoyed the hell out of this movie. It's like a great start off to one of my favorite franchises. The characters are me very memorable. The interaction between the three main leads is just terrific. The dialogue is witty, funny and intriguing and it's full of memorable quotes for in the history of screenwriting. Practical and special effects are spot on and they, they blend in just so well. It really feels like show it makes you feel like you're in a whole strange, wondrous, and dangerous environment. And recognize that there's some flaws in this movie, like like why Leia did not recognize that the Million Fox was being trapped when she was delivering the plans to the uh, rebel base on Yavin 4. Why is Darth Vader choking the life out of Captain Antilles when he's, he's telling him where is the ambassador on this consular ship? And why the stormtroopers are just kind of, well, stupid at times in this movie, like when they're like chasing Han Solo and uh, Chewbacca, they were like saying, close the blast doors! And when the blast doors are closed, the heroes got through and then, and then this one of the stormtroopers was like, open the blast doors, open the blast doors! I mean, what, what's the reason of closing the blast doors again? It's just ridiculous. But if you overlook those flaws, you will love this movie as much as I do. So I'm gonna give Star Wars a solid 10 out of 10. It's just a superb start off. Thank you for watching this video, guys. I hope you enjoy watching about my thoughts on this movie as much as I do. As always, be sure to like, subscribe, and if you have been all thoughts about this movie, be sure to give your comments on the section below. And be sure to come back when I talk about one of the greatest film sequels out there. Later.